In this video, I'm going to build a responsive and fully accessible navbar. Almost every website needs that functionality and it can be quite troubling for beginners to do it the right way. So in this video, we're going to stick to this plan. Step 1. Create a clean and minimalist design in HTML and CSS. Step 2. Add menu buttons that open and close the navbar using JavaScript. Step 3. Improve the user experience with transitions and a close on exit functionality. Step 4. Make it accessible by applying the correct ARIA attributes and update them with JavaScript. You're going to learn so many things about responsive web design, accessibility and user experience, as we also address the small but important details that not many other tutorials out there will cover. My name is Fabian and this is coding to go the channel where you learn the most relevant coding concepts in just a few minutes. In HTML, we need the nav tag, which is the correct semantic HTML tag for navigational elements like navbars. Inside, we have an unordered list with a few list items, where each list item holds a link that references the subpages of the website. We have a link for home, about, features, pricing, and login. These are all separate HTML pages with a bit of example content so that we can click on these links in the browser. This is the very basic functionality of a navbar in HTML. But now let's make it look good in CSS. I always recommend planning your software in advance before building it. For that, I recommend to use Miro. Miro is a great innovation workspace where you can brainstorm ideas, plan projects with your team and create diagrams with the help of Miro AI. With just a simple prompt, you will have your customized diagram in seconds to start faster. Here you can see the Miro board that I prepared for this video. For the desktop version of the navbar, we want to build a responsive flexbox layout that looks somewhat like this. We'll have a few navigational links with one marked as active and the login link in an accent color. I also prepared the color palette for a navbar, which we can copy into our CSS code by setting up the custom properties in the root. I'm going for a dark mode design, but everything in this tutorial will work exactly the same if you choose a different color palette. On the right side, you can see the plan for the mobile version. Since the navbar will collapse into a hamburger menu, we need to write some JavaScript code to expand and collapse the sidebar when the user clicks on these buttons. So this is the general idea I have for the navbar. Of course, there's more things that we need to implement in the background when we code it. But the design aspect is just a tiny part of what is possible with Miro. Miro has a massive collection of templates, which allows you to do basically anything you would need in an agile team or as a solo developer. It is very intuitive to use, even if you have no experience in UX design or diagramming in general. You can create flowcharts, ER diagrams and UML diagrams with Miro AI, which will help speed things up. With just a simple prompt, you will have your customized diagram in seconds to start faster. There's much more Miro can do, so I highly recommend that you try it out yourself by clicking the first link in the video description. A big thank you to Miro for sponsoring this video. Now let's continue with the CSS code. At the start of any project, I like to change a few default settings that you see here. The only special thing here is that I applied box sizing border box on every element, since I found that it prevents a lot of problems that might happen with padding. Nothing too complicated. Now let's take care of the navbar. I apply a background color and border bottom. The UL will have a list style of none to remove the bullet points and display flex to define a flexbox layout. We only need that so that we can now address the home li, which is the first item in the navbar. I simply use classes in HTML. Because here I want to apply a margin right of auto. This will move all the other links to the right side with only the home link staying on the left side. The links will also get a few styles. Note that we haven't used any height or width so far, because the padding of the links will control the size of everything. That is also why I changed the display to flex, because padding doesn't work well on inline level elements. We also set up a transition for the hover effect. Here I simply change the background color. Now I want to apply a bit of styling to the active link and one for the login link. There are many ways to do this, but for simplicity I simply use classes in HTML. The active link will get a border bottom and the accent link a background color. Later, we will apply the active link class to whatever link we are currently located on every other HTML page. So when we are on the about page, then the about link should have a border bottom. But let's not do that now because we need a few more changes in the HTML code to make everything accessible. One thing that I noticed with these links is that we have a weird little gap right here when we hover over it. Right between the background color and the border of the navbar, there's this weird little gap. Usually that happens when we are missing a display flag somewhere. So after trying a few things that didn't work, I found that applying a display flex on the list items will solve the problem. Now the gap is gone and the desktop version of our navbar is completed. Let's make this website responsive by making adjustments for our mobile users. By inspecting the page in the browser, we can find out the breakpoint for our media query. 
meaning at what screen size this layout will no longer work and we have to put things into a hamburger menu. And that breakpoint is around here, at 700 pixels. I know that we have a bit more space, but just to be safe, I will choose this as my breakpoint. Now in the media query, we want to apply the following changes. The navbar is fixed at the top right of the screen, and it will span the entire height. The Z index makes sure that it won't be covered by any other element on the website. In the UL, we align everything vertically using flex direction column. The links will have a width of 100% and a bit of padding left. I also removed the styles for the active link and the home li, since this will look strange in the sidebar. If you want, you can also remove the styles for the accent link, but I don't think it's necessary. The mobile sidebar is now complete. What we need to do now is to implement the logic that we use to open and close the sidebar using menu buttons and a bit of JavaScript. Before we do that, you should learn about the CSS logic that is used for this. To hide the sidebar, we're going to move it off screen. To do this, we need to change the right property and set this to negative 100%. This will move it off screen on the right side. Now, when we apply the show class on the navbar, we can set this property back to zero. Now having this class in CSS means that we can now apply and remove this class to open and close the sidebar. You can see that mechanism if I manipulate the class in the browser developer tools. Here I can add and remove the show class on the navbar to open and close the sidebar. For an optimal user experience, we should also apply a transition to this in CSS. Now the sidebar will slide in and out with a smooth transition. But all of that should be controlled using menu buttons. For that, we need to create these buttons in HTML. First, we need the open sidebar button, which contains a hamburger menu icon. You can download the SVG in the video description. Then inside the UL, we need another list item to add the close sidebar button. This one will contain the X icon. In CSS, both of these buttons will have a few styles to match our design. Now back in HTML, these buttons need an on-click attribute. The open sidebar button should call the JavaScript function open sidebar. The close sidebar button will call the function close sidebar. Pretty simple. Now let's define what these functions actually do in JavaScript. Make sure that you use the defer attribute when you embed your JavaScript file. This way it will wait for the website to finish loading. In JavaScript, we first need to get the navbar using its ID navbar. Since we don't have that yet, let's quickly assign that ID in HTML, navbar. Then we define both functions, open sidebar and close sidebar. To open the sidebar, we simply assign the class show to the navbar. When we close the sidebar, we need to remove the same class, show. You remember, this CSS class will modify the right property to slide in and out the sidebar. And that should already work in the browser. We can click on the menu buttons to open and close the sidebar. But these menu buttons will also cause a problem. On desktop screens, they shouldn't be there. Simply set their display to none. And inside the media query, we set the display to block. Now they're only visible on mobile screens. To improve the user experience, we should implement a close on exit functionality. Many users want to close the sidebar by simply clicking outside of it. Currently, nothing happens when we do that. We can only close the sidebar using the X button. So let's add an overlay in HTML. It doesn't matter where you create it as long as it comes after the nav tag in HTML. Simply add a div container with the ID overlay. In CSS, I'm going to apply a red background color just so that we can see what I'm doing. By applying position fixed and inset zero, we can make it cover the entire screen. Apply a Z index of nine so that it is in front of everything else except the navbar, which has a Z index of 10. Let's also change the background color. Usually an overlay should be black and slightly transparent so that it darkens the website. And of course, by default, it should be hidden using display none. Only when the sidebar is opened, the overlay should appear. So let's write, if nav.show is applied, use the sibling selector to select the overlay. Here we set the display to block again. With this simple CSS rule, we should have an overlay that darkens the rest of the website when the sidebar is expanded. Now in HTML, we can simply assign an onClick attribute with the same function that the close sidebar button uses, close sidebar. This will now close the sidebar when the user clicks on the overlay. Great. But here's the thing, this website is not perfectly accessible. But we can fix that quite easily by applying a few ARIA attributes in HTML. For example, the overlay might be a bit confusing for assistive technologies. We have an onclick attribute on a div container, which is not great for accessibility. But by applying an ARIA attribute like ARIA hidden equals true, we can control that this element should not be exposed to an accessibility API. So for a blind person, this overlay doesn't exist, which is totally fine since it cannot be reached by the tab key anyways. 
Instead, they rely on the close button. This one should also have an aria attribute. We should use the aria label to describe what this button is doing. Since the button has an icon as a child element and no text content, a blind person would not understand what this button is used for. But whatever we assign to this aria label attribute will be read aloud by a screen reader technology. The same goes for the open sidebar button. Here we assign the aria label open sidebar. And since this button is controlling an interactive element, it also needs a few more aria attributes. The aria expanded attribute is set to false, because by default, the navbar that this element controls is not expanded. Use the aria controls attribute to assign the ID navbar, which explains that this button controls the navbar. You can see the explanation for these attributes when you hover over them in Visual Studio Code. Another useful aria attribute is needed to specify the active link. Since right now this is only a class that we use in CSS, we need to assign aria current equals page. This tells the screen reader that this is the current website. Now one thing that you should definitely not forget is to update the aria expanded attribute. Per default we set this to false because the sidebar is not expanded. But the moment the user opens the sidebar using the menu button, it should be updated and set to true. So let's quickly do that in JavaScript by getting the open button set attribute aria expanded and set this to true. In the close sidebar function, we set this attribute to false. Now in the browser's developer tools, we can see this attribute being updated every time we open or close the sidebar. A disabled person that cannot see usually navigates through a website using the focus. You can move around the focus using the tab key on your keyboard. It usually only works on elements that you can interact with, like buttons, links, etc. And as a developer, one thing is very important when you think about the focus. The focus should not be placed on elements that are not visible. In the mobile version of the navbar, when the sidebar is collapsed, we can still move the focus to the individual links of the sidebar. That is because the sidebar is not actually hidden. It is not using display none. Instead, we just moved it off screen using the right property. So what we need to do is to remove the element from the accessibility tree when it is not on screen. That way the user should not be able to place the focus on elements that are off screen. To achieve this, you would normally use the hidden attribute. This removes the element from the accessibility tree. It makes it not tabigatable, but it also hides the element visually from the screen exactly like display none. But we don't want that because then the sidebar will disappear without our transition. So instead we can use the inert attribute. This one is a bit newer and works similar to the hidden attribute. It also removes the element from the accessibility tree. It makes it untabigatable, but it does not hide it visually from the screen with display none, which is exactly what we want. So how do we do that? We need to assign the inert attribute only when we are on mobile devices, which depends on the screen size. So we basically need a media query in JavaScript, which looks like this. Now we need to write a function, update navbar, which takes an event as an argument. We call this function directly on page load and pass the media variable as an argument. For now, let's simply go to the update navbar function and simply console log the event, meaning the media variable, just to see what happens. In the browser, we can see that on a desktop screen, it will console log the media query list. Here we have a property called matches. This boolean contains the information if the condition of the media query is met or not. And since we are on a desktop screen, this boolean is set to false because the width of the screen is not smaller than 700 pixels. But if we change to a mobile screen, which is smaller than 700 pixels, and now reload the page in the browser, then this matches boolean will be set to true. So this boolean contains the information if we are on a mobile device or not. So just to have things clear in JavaScript, I will create an isMobile variable that stores the event.matches. When this variable is true, then we are on a mobile device. If it's false, we are on a desktop device. So let's use this variable in a if condition. We want to apply the inert attribute to the navbar. So let's say if is mobile navbar.set attribute inert. Else, meaning we are on a desktop device, navbar.remove attribute inert. This will work exactly as expected if we test it in the browser. The navbar is hidden from the accessibility tree. But we also need to take into account that the user might change the screen size. So when the page initially loads, is mobile is set to true. But then he changes to a desktop screen, and in that case, the inert attribute is still applied, and we cannot access the links of the navbar. In that case, we need to update the navbar. So let's add an event listener to the media variable, and listen for any change. On change, we call the updateNavbar function, and pass the event as an argument. 
That way, whenever the media query list changes, the isMobile boolean will be updated and in the if condition, the inert attribute will be set or removed, depending on the device. Pretty cool. But the moment the user opens the sidebar, we should remove the inert attribute again, because then the user should be able to navigate through the links, and vice versa. When we close the sidebar, we need to set the inert attribute again. Now the website is much more accessible than before. We made sure to use the correct ARRI attributes and prevent problems that occur with the focus. But there are also a few optional things that you might want to consider for an even better user experience and improved accessibility. The first thing is, what if all your links are bookmark links? So instead of linking to other HTML pages, you link to the ID of an element that is on the same website. So when the user clicks on it, it scrolls to that position. In that case, we also need to close the sidebar on mobile. Currently, that doesn't happen because we assume that you change the website to another HTML page, which automatically closes the navbar. To fix this, you need to get all your nav links and loop over it. Here, you apply an event listener on every link. It will call the function close sidebar. This will close the sidebar when you click on a link. Another optional thing is the skip link. This is a cool way to make the website even more accessible by making it easier to reach the main content of your website. If you hit tap the first time, the skip link appears. And if you use it, it moves the focus to the main content of the website. That way, a disabled user does not have to navigate through every link of the navbar. To do this, simply add this skip link as the first thing in your HTML body. Here you link to the ID of the main content. In CSS, you hide this link completely because it should not be visible to a normal user. You only show it when the focus is applied, using the focus pseudo class in CSS. Accessibility is one of those topics where it is really difficult to achieve perfection, since there's always something you can improve on the website. But I hope I managed to teach you something about it. If you ever learned something interesting in any of our videos, then consider subscribing to this channel. It really does help more than you think. And if you have ideas of how to improve the navbar even further, then please share your thoughts in the comments so that we can all learn from each other. My name is Fabian and this was Coding to Go. I will see you in the next video.